Okay, so in this session, uh, Hilke Kurs from Surf Sara and Ilona von Stein from Dance are going to guide you through certification and assessment for data repositories and services. And in particular, they will touch uh, base on evaluation of core trust seal and its implications for maturity modeling, uh, on assessment of fairness of data sets, and of fair assessment uh, framework for data services beyond repositories. The session will start with the uh, presentation of some of the recent outputs from the first fair project, and then we will engage you um, in some um, um, polls using a Mentimeter uh, tool. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping for the uh, event. So the event has been uh, recorded entirely, as you, as you know. Your microphones are off. So we invite you to use the Zoom chat for questions, as you know, or raise your hand um, in case you need to, to speak. Uh, as said, we'll invite you to a Mentimeter poll later on, and we'll share again the code for the poll uh, uh, following the presentation. We are uh, taking collaborative notes. Uh, there is a shared file. So if you want to contribute and add any inputs there, please feel free to do so. First Fair in a nutshell, First Fair was funded by the Horizon 2020 Infraels Part C call. It started in March uh, 2019 and it will last for 36 months. There are six core partners in the project. So DANS, who is the DCC coordinator, the SCC, DCC, EUA, uh, SCFC, CSC and Trust IT services. But the project has 22 partners in total in from eight different countries. The objective of the project is to uh, survey uh, the landscape of fair activities in relation to the EOSC and create a, uh, create a basis for harmonization efforts of all those actors working in the fair ecosystems and trying to build in, um, an active community around EOSC. In particular, we try to identify overlaps, divergences, and challenges uh, related to the EOSC framework with a special focus uh, on the recommendations uh, that were identified by the high level expert group on fair data in the turning fail into reality report, and to accelerate the realization of the uh, goals of the EOSC uh, in all um, fair related matters. The first fair project is structured around seven work packages. Um, two are dedicated to the management and uh, engagement and dissemination, while other five work packages are really uh, bringing um, to the project the real uh, technical activities. In the session today, uh, you're going to see the results in particular of two uh, work packages dedicated to fair practices, semantics, interoperability, and services, and another one dedicated to the certification of repositories. The first fair project is supported by two groups of experts. Uh, the first one is the High Level Advisory Committee, made up of nine experts who provide strategic advice to the project. And the second one is the European Group of Fair Champions that currently counts 11 members from different disciplines and different projects in Europe. And its mandate is mainly to ensure uptake of first fair results by their um, communities. One of the key actors of this, the, the first fair project is the synchronization force, um, a, a team of people working to enabling uh, a dialogue among the various uh, projects in the EOSC, uh, and working in particular to maximize coordination and minimize unnecessary overlaps, uh, encourage the dovetailing of project uh, activities uh, with the EOSC governance, and promote the mechanisms to um, collaborate turning FAIR uh, into uh, reality. The synchronization force is uh, gathering representatives from the main um, uh, actors in, in the ecosystems, so namely the regional thematic initiatives, 
the uh, esprit clusters, and of course, the yes, working groups representatives. In particular, we have stronger relations with the fair working group and its task groups. And uh, we are also working with other horizontal activities and other fair related initiatives. The synchronization force met physically the first time uh, last year in November in conjunction with the IOSC symposium in Budapest and is meeting for the second time uh, now in these days uh, with a series of uh, virtual workshops taking place between <clears throat> April and the 11th of June when the final concluding session uh, will take place. So I conclude now my presentation uh, inviting notes for our uh, poster, which is uh, number seven in the list. And we remind you that the voting closes uh, tonight at uh, half past five Central European time. I'm Sara Pitonet from Trust IT Services, and I now welcome Hilke uh, from Fairs Fair and from uh, Serbs. Uh, Hilke, up to you. Uh, Great, thank you very much. Let me unmute and share my screen. There we go. Can everybody hear me okay and can people see my screen? Yes, you can. Great, let me take it away. So thanks a lot, uh, Sarah, for the, uh, the nice introduction. And, and thanks a lot to all of you for coming. It's great to see so many people uh, in, in the audience. Uh, we have a nice saying in the Netherlands, elk voordeel, elk nadeel hebt zijn voordeel, which translates to uh, every disadvantage has its advantage. And I think the disadvantage of doing this offline or doing this online virtually is that um, many people have the opportunity to join. Um, and it's great that uh, so many people of you have taken advantage of it. So uh, thank you all for doing that and uh, um, welcome very much. So my name is Hilke Koers. I'm a group leader of the data management services team at Surfsara. Uh, Surfsara is a Dutch national organization for high performance computing and research data management. And I'm also the task leader of Fair is Fair task 2.4, which pertains itself with fair assessment of services and software. And that is the topic that I wanted to talk about today. So in the task, we set out to work on perhaps a rather naive question or trying to formulate answers to a perhaps a naive question. What does it take for a data service to be fair? Um, this was our starting point. And what I wanted to do in my presentation is talk you through some of our discussions around that um, to really sharpen the thinking um, and also to refine the objectives for, uh, for the task. I wanted to present what we have done so far um, and also share with you what is our plan uh, going forward, how we plan to take this further. And then, of course, um, very important, I'd love to hear from you about your thoughts around um, data services, what are important data services um, in, in the context of FAIR, what are important criteria for data services to help data be FAIR, etc. So we'll do that at the end. So I'll try to be v relatively brief in the presentation part so that we have enough time for um, the more interactive part where um, you can give your input and we have a bit of discussion around that. So actually the starting point in our conversations with the group from this question is, is this really even a good question? And should we be speaking about fair services or is there perhaps a different frame that we should take? And, and really to think about that, we wanted to go back all the way to um, the very foundation of, of data and of the digital objects, the bits and bytes. Because as we all know, at the end of the day, that is what we are talking about. But we also know to make these objects truly findable and accessible and interoperable and reusable, we need to go beyond just the bits and the bytes. We need to have metadata, we need to have persistent identifiers. And of course, it's important that these objects uh, follow certain standards so that also other researchers can easily find and, and use them. So if you take that together, you arrive at the notion of a digital object, which I think is a very meaningful level of, of abstraction uh, that encapsulates not only the bitstream, but also persistent identifiers, metadata, and, and of course builds on existing standards, um, which can apply to different types of digital outputs, of course, the data sets, but also research software, methods, ontologies, etc., etc. 
these digital objects can exist in various places in the data lifecycle. They can represent data that just comes out of an observational device and just comes out of a certain um, apparatus. They can represent data that's actively being analyzed, data that's already in a repository. And of course, very important at the end of the day, the data that's being reused by other researchers. Now, if you think about data at these data sets or digital objects, and it can also apply to software or other types of, of research outputs in these various stages, um, you, you immediately see that in order to really do something with the data, to get value out of it, uh, for the data to be more than just a static, inert piece of content, you need to be able to act on it. You need to have tools, you need to have services. For example, when the data is being gathered, of course, there's a measurement uh, device, um, hopefully uh, some provision, some service to add machine metadata to the object right when it's being uh, created. Data analysis tools that take the uh, FAIR digital object and, and operate on it, turn it into something else that, uh, that, that is uh, um, of more value for, for the, the, the scientific insights that you get out of it. In the data repository, there is functions for uploading, annotation, stewardship, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, of course, uh, function services to aggregate the data and the metadata, expose them to search tools, and give people the ability to download the data and act on it. So it's really this combination of the FAIR digital object, the content, and the services that act on them to be able to really get value out of the data and be able to do something with it. There are supporting services as well that underpin all of these, for example, functions, services that, uh, that, that meet uh, persistent identifiers, <coughs> linking tools, registries, and so on and so forth. So a whole supporting infrastructure to be able to do all of these things with your data and your other digital objects. So a way of thinking about it, which I kind of like, is if you see the digital objects as the musical notes in, 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 in our world of, of data, then the services are the rhythm and, and the cadence that, 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 that add the dynamics to, the, to the, uh, the music. And you need both of them to really have a perfect symphony or a fair data ecosystem. So actually the way we re slightly rephrase the thinking in our task around fair service is not so much what does it take for a service to be fair, but rather what does it take to enable fair and re really be an integral component of this ecosystem where services act on fair digital objects to enrich them, to add value, and, and perhaps make them more fair. I'm, I'm mindful that the way I've been speaking about it is fairly hand-waving, of course. Um, a lot of this is made much more firm and given more detail in the Turning Fair into Reality report that appeared in 2018. I think some of the authors of this work are also present in the session, so, so that's great. So a lot of these notions are made much more precise in this report. And if you haven't read it or looked into it yet, I would highly recommend you do, because uh, it really gives the scaffolding to, to think about this in more detail. So what's the issue then? If we have that report and we have this notion of a fair data ecosystem, um, what do we still need to do? Well, quite a lot of things that still need to be elaborated more because as you know, FAIR is not an absolute, but it's a set of guiding principles that still needs to be taken further that requires more interpretation and definition to really be able to do something with it and to become really actionable. Um, for FAIR data, there's been a lot of work that has been done on also quantifying the fairness of um, uh, a digital object representing data. There are all kinds of checklists, assessments, certification criteria, etc. But for services, that's not really the case. And there's actually very little guidance that service owners can, can benefit from that tells them how to make their service fit in this FAIR data ecosystem. So this is really what FAIR is FAIR task 2.4 is all about. It's our objective and we will deliver that uh, at the end of, uh, uh, or the beginning of 2022. There's still a little bit of time for us. Working towards an assessment framework, a fair assessment framework for data services that will enable and stimulate this kind of interplay, this symphony between digital object and the services that act on them. We're also working on a fair assessment framework for software, equally important in terms of the scope of the work, but not so much the topic of, uh, of, the, of the session today. So I'll really be focusing on the service aspect of our work. 
So what we've done so far, we took a little bit of time to review the existing FAIR assessment frameworks for data, also because we think they can serve as inspiration for assessment frameworks for services, and in a sense, the services need to build on what we already have for, for the data. We've also looked at existing assessment certification frameworks for services, not necessarily FAIR, but what's out there in general. We've done a couple of case studies where we did a bit of an, an, an ad hoc bottom-up analysis, if you like, looking at an existing service and, and trying to answer the question, do we actually feel that this service is enabling FAIR? And, and if so, in, in, in what sense is it doing that? Um, so rather than first, well, defining a lot of methodology, just starting from an existing service and trying to make sense of this question, with then the aim to abstract that to a more formal methodology later on. And we've also formulated some guiding principles for this assessment framework. So not yet the guiding principles for the services itself, but more what do we think the framework should, should be about and what are, what are sort of the, the boundary conditions or the desired aspects of such a framework. And of course, we had a lot of interactions and very, very useful beneficial discussions with stakeholders and other related working groups and projects. I wanted to quickly show you one case study, not so much for the detail of the specific case study, but more around some of the aspects of the methodology that emerged. So we took a look at uh, a couple of uh, services from uh, the, the, the EOS portfolio, one of them being B2Find. And then what we did is just mapped against the FAIR principles. And for every principle, we tried to formulate an answer to the question, is this service enabling this FAIR data principle? Is it act when it acts on the, on the FAIR digital object, is it making it more findable, for example? And then the specific formulation of, well, the F1 principle. Is it respecting that property or is it reducing it? And we felt that these, well, this set of three, or actually it can also be not applicable, of course, if the service completely does nothing with that particular FAIR, uh, FAIR principle, then, then uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a non-applicable. Non, non but mostly it's a choice of three, and we found that a much more valuable way to think about it rather than a binary yes, no. So for every of the FAIR principles, we asked the question, is this service really actively improving that? Is it sort of respecting it, fair in, fair out, if you like? It's not adding it, but it's also not destroying the FAIR property when it operates on a FAIR digital object, or is it actually reducing it? So this is the kind of mapping that we came up with. Um, and like I said, it's not so much at this point to really scrutinize b to find or any of the other services, but really to formulate a sensible methodology that we can now formalize more in the, in, in the work that is ahead. So in the case of b to find we find that, well, actually, if you look at the uh, FAIR principle FAIR 1, metadata are assigned a globally unique and eternally persistent identifier. B defined respects that if it operates, if it acts on a digital object, that property is kept, it's respected, it's maintained, but B defined in itself does not provide you with this property. Um, as opposed to F2, data are described with rich metadata. Here, B defined is actually enabling that. It is um, elevating that, uh, that, that fair aspect of a, of a fair digital object. Where we are right now in the process, so um, some of the things that I or the things that I presented and a little bit more are described in more detail in a first assessment report. It's available on Zenodo. Um, we very much welcome your feedback. There is a Google Doc that's still open, so you can leave your feedback there or by any other means that, 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 that you would find appropriate. Um, so if you're interested in this, please take a moment and uh, let us know what you think. There's still quite a bit of work ahead. We started the task in uh, last September. Um, so we're sort of three quarters of a year in, um, so we still have ample time to refine the thinking. And so your, your input is still very value, uh, valuable. This is the team for task 2.4. Um, we have the, uh, the good fortune that there's some, some, some really smart, clever, cooperative people. So a really nice team and we've had some really high quality, great discussions. So, uh, so that's been great. And now I wanted to move on to the more interactive part. I would propose that we save questions and points for discussion to the end. At the end of the session, we have reserved a little bit of time for that as well. Um, so if you have any questions about the presentation, we can pick that up at the end. Um, but for now, we wanted to spend a bit of time on also getting your views and your input around 
certification assessment uh, for data services. Um, and we've set up a Mentimeter for that. Um, so I would ask you to open up menti.com and then use the code 89191. Uh, and then for the purpose of the presentation, Sarah, I am going to ask you to then take back control because um, all being well, you should have the Menti view open. Yes, I have it. And I see people who are starting to provide an answer to the first question. Can you all see the screen and the balloons popping? I can see the screen, so I'm assuming others can see it as well. Right. So first question also to get to know the audience a little bit, uh, a little bit better and help us understand the context to, to, uh, to, to your answers to the other questions is uh, to describe yourself. Um, we want to leave it open. So uh, in your own words, how would you describe your role in relation to data repositories and services? I see we have a repositories hacker amongst us. That's great. We'd love to hear a little bit more about your experiences later. Service providers, managing a data service, a user, research consultant. Mm -hmm. Some people are both a user and a manager. I think many of us wear different hats in, the, in, this, uh, um, in this arena. <coughs> Let's leave it open for a little bit while there are still responses coming in. But it looks like we have a very nice mix of different perspective, which is uh, which is great for the discussion. All right. 54, let's wait a little bit. We have 159 people in the audience, 57 responses. So I think we can still do a little bit better. Participants. Say again? No, we have uh, very diligent participants. I mean, more than one third of them is replying. Thank you. Okay, shall we move on, Milke? Yeah, let's move on, that's fine. So thank you much for sharing that. And we'll use this also in the analysis so that we are able to segment the responses a little bit on the basis of your role, if you're a data provider or a provider of services or more a consumer. So the second question, um, we wanted to ask you to name three types of data service that you yourself would consider essential to enable fair data. So imagine we start designing this all from scratch. What are three types of services that you would find absolutely necessary to enable fair data? And I would ask you to focus on technology type of services. Of course, there's a lot of uh, more yeah, non-technological non services as well, uh, but, but let's zoom in a little bit on the technology side. I still see a lot of feedback coming in, so let's leave it open for a little bit. I see some of the usual suspects, if you like, but also a few more uncommon ones. CPID services, data repositories, annotations, licensing, BMPs, AAI, important aspect as well of course data citation services excellent ontologies
We're almost at 60, so let's leave it open for a little bit still. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to elaborate a little bit on why they have selected these type of data services? If you would want to add a bit more detail to that, or perhaps just some rationalization, could you raise your hand and then we can open up the microphone for you. Anyone brave enough to give a little bit of context? Paolo Manji wants to raise his hand. Yes, Paolo, you can very much raise your hand. Let's see if I can find you so that I can unmute you. Bear with me. Paolo, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Hilke. Hey, thanks for joining. Hello, everybody. Um, no, I'd just like to elaborate because we've, um, we've been experiencing this um, uh, lately and uh, <clears throat> of course apart from the infrastructural services which are key like uh, persistent identifiers and this kind of enablers I think uh, that today one of the key uh, propositions would be to make thematic services so uh, the places where scientists perform their science where they execute their digital experiments um, open science by design so expect the services to publish on behalf and under the authorization of the users all the elements that are needed to repeat the experiment. Mm -hmm. So basically, aspects such as provenance, attribution, uh, semantic interlinking, uh, in yeah. the, the position, the proper repository selected by the community, uh, user uh, IDs, uh, et cetera, the proper usage of PIDs should be managed uh, for the, substantially by, by the services used by the users. Yeah. Uh, open science requires a big effort in terms of publishing, which cannot be left to the upload, manual upload uh, of scientists to different repositories. So thematic Great. services are key. Yeah, so full stack open science. I see Andras has also raised his hand. Andras, I will unmute you um, for a comment and then we'll go to the next question because we still have a few that we would like to cover. Um, Andras, the floor is yours. Uh, my answers were uh, intended to be non-trivial. I think uh, the most important thing is to help researchers uh, uh, make uh, their data fair. So uh, one of the words I've chosen was consultancy. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of uh, researchers would need help uh, in for making uh, their data fair or more fair. Uh, another word is evaluation. Uh, it, it would be nice for researchers to, to check, uh, to be able to check uh, how fair uh, their data is. And the third word is enhancement. Mm -hmm. uh, I would find very attractive to uh, get services which help uh, to enhance uh, my, my data set. For instance, uh, proposing finding uh, uh, linkable uh, uh, pieces of metadata or uh, enhancing uh, the data in, in, in any possible way. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for that contribution. Very useful, thank you. I'm sure there's still a lot that we can say about this and we can come back to it in the, uh, the open discussion at the end. Uh, but for now, let's move on to the next question because we have a few other things that we'd really like to get your input on. So this question is not about the services itself, but more the qualities or the type of you know, the attributes that you would expect from a data service to enable fair data. So what do you consider to be the most important qualities for a data service to really be fair enabling?
I see trustworthiness coming up repeatedly. That is great. We'll also talk a little bit about trustworthiness in the context of data repositories in the second half of this uh, session. Interoperability, no paywall, transparency, sustainable, open science by design. That might be Paolo again. Interoperability coming up quite a bit. Excellent. Persistence, yeah. User friendliness, I've also seen that a couple of times. Following community standards, great. Correct attribution to data providers. I also really like that one. I think that's very important. Ah, we already have 73 participants. So more people are getting engaged in giving feedback. That's wonderful. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, let me ask maybe one, just in view of the time, is there someone who responded around trust or trustworthiness on the, around the quality for data services? Um, someone who would like to elaborate a little bit on what trustworthiness means for them in this context, if you would be willing to say a few words about that please raise your hand or say so in the chat window no, no hands then i propose in view of the time let's move on and then uh, there are still some other questions where i would again invite some uh, uh, some discussion let's move on to the next question uh, sarah so this is a rating question because uh, if we speak about fair assessment of services that can still mean many different things to many different people and here i've tried to summarize that into three different levels of maturity if you like one is around sharing good practices recommendations for fair enabling service the second one is a self-assessment tool already a little bit more formalized and the third one would really be formal certification um, so and there is a formal certification stamp for a fair enabling service my question for you is how important would you feel for these three different types of assessments slash certifications do you think good, just sharing good practices is the most important? Do you feel formal certification is most important? Or this uh, self-assessment tool, which perhaps sits a bit in the middle? In the next question, I'm going to ask you to elaborate on why you chose those values, but for now, really just on a rating of one to 10. Let's wait a little bit. There's 50 people who have given their response. There might be a few still coming in. Interesting to see that, uh, well, most people find these uh, sharing good practices and recommendations most important, then self-assessment and then certification. 
But in the certification, you see these two bumps. So there's also part of the audience who really feels very strongly about that. That's, uh, that's really interesting. We'll leave it open for a few more seconds. Last opportunity to cast your vote. So again, thank you very much. That's really valuable and helpful. Let's move on to the next slide where I wanted to ask you to motivate that in particular, if you have given different scores, uh, would be really great to understand why you value one of these elements or why you find that more important than, than one of the others. And this is the last question for my bit of the session. So please tell me if you find best practices, good practices, more important than formal certification or the other way around. Why, why is that? Okay, all equally important. About flexibility, yeah, I understand that argument. Ah. Steps one and two might be a prerequisite to get to three. That's also a really good insight. Many people also gave equal scores. That's also very good to know. Somebody here mentions the aspect of uh, demoralization. Yeah? That maybe an, 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 a side effect of certification can be that some people are left out, which is, of course, also not something uh, yeah, that, that we wish. There is already courts are sealed in combination with fair guidelines. Very, very good observation. We'll speak more about that in the, the second bit of the session. Françoise, thank you for your comments. Important to see it as a stepped process where maybe we would start with establishing good practice, et cetera, and then moving on to self-assessment and certification. All right, 28 people have given their feedback so far. In view of the time, we need to move on shortly. So last few seconds to share your motivation, if you wish. Great. I have wanted also to invite people here to motivate their feedback, but actually you've already done that here in writing. Maybe time allowing at the end of the session, we have 15 minutes for open discussion. We can come back to this because I think this is a subject that at least I would love to tease out in a little bit more detail. But in view of the time, we're midway the session. I would propose that we move on to uh, uh, the second part of the session and give the floor to Ilona. Yeah. Thanks, Ilke. So I'll, I'll stop sharing for the moment. And Ilona, uh, floor to you. Yes, hi everyone. I'll start sharing my screen. Give me one minute, please. Uh, can you see my screen okay? We see the presenter mode, Ilona, so also um, the other slides, etc. Ah, yeah, okay. Let's try how to fix that. I think when you click uh, share screen, you have to, you can choose between your primary or secondary screen. Hmm. I'll try again. house now uh, we see the slides but also the powerpoint uh, so we also see the the navigation on yes this yeah. is it. okay so this should be the right one thanks Joke, for guiding me through the technical stuff 
So uh, welcome everybody to the uh, second part of this session. Uh, I'm Ilona von Stein. I work with Dans in the Netherlands and uh, we are the Netherlands Institute for Permanent Access to uh, Research Data. And I would like to dive with you into the topic of uh, fair enabling repository data services. And I will focus on evaluation, assessment uh, and certification. The scope of my presentation of this part is on the one hand about evaluation and certification of data repositories. And on the other hand, I will focus on evaluation and certification of FAIR data. So I take the FAIR enabling perspective, uh, just as Hilke did before. And also I take the perspective on, uh, of the FAIR digital object. And uh, also uh, the complementarity between those is very important. So I will dive into that a little deeper as well. Uh, with this scope in mind, um, I would like to just provide you a little bit of background uh, because I think that uh, repository practices, they enable uh, fair principles for digital objects. Um, I think they do so, and this is also a starting point for my work, they do so because those services ensure, at least to a certain extent, uh, the fairness of your data set. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, they also perform long-term stewardship and curation. So very important, I think, that the data remains fair over time. If you see the repositories in relation to certification, uh, a, a common starting point is to think that repositories are assessed against guidelines or standards to evaluate their trustworthiness. Uh, a few certification frameworks uh, do exist uh, to assess the quality of a repository and uh, Cortio Seal is in common use for that. So now I go to what FAIR is FAIR is doing in the area of assessment of the FAIR enabling repositories. Uh, I've highlighted three aspects here and uh, I would like to go uh, through them with you uh, over the next couple of slides. So I will touch on the, our work on the FAIR alignment of certification schemes. Uh, also, I will, um, yeah, I will share a little bit more about a European network of trustworthy repositories that enable FAIR. And also in the light of the FAIR enabling repositories, uh, we're working on providing an improved registry for finding and selecting relevant trustworthy repositories. So the first thing we are doing uh, under the umbrella of FAIR enabling, uh, we are aligning the core to seal requirements uh, with the FAIR data practices uh, to identify how repositories can enable FAIR data. And all this we do under the conviction that context matters. So really the evaluation of object fairness cannot be done in isolation from its context. Again, we take the fair object versus the fair enabling environment perspective. Uh, the design methodology we have here is to use um, uh, is to use the core trust seal requirements as a baseline uh, and elaborate them uh, in which in a way that they demonstrate that the repository enables fairness. In this capability maturity approach, uh, we use uh, the uh, core trust seal compliance levels as well as the CMMI approach. So this is the capability maturity model integration approach. And we hope that with such a maturity approach, um, we may support repositories at lower levels of maturity in defining and achieving their goals. So we are focusing also on uh, continuous improvement here. The next slide gives three uh, figures in the middle that show some uh, outcomes of our work. For example, on the left hand side, uh, we have an, proposed uh, an initial core to steel plus fair mapping. Uh, in the middle image, you see the CMMI maturity model. And in the right image, there is the core to steel process, uh, which is a self-assessment and peer review model. So I would like to say with this slide that the ideal outcome of our work uh, would be a core to steel process, which certifies repositories as fair enabling trustworthy data repositories. Uh, it's also important to highlight that within FAIR is FAIR, so during the course of the project, 
so we will still have uh, more than one and a half years left. Uh, we will not foresee a pass-fail outcome, uh, nor we will perform or govern a formal process of fair enabled certification through core trust seal. However, obviously, uh, it's very important that we share our recommendations for the fair integration into core trust seal with them, and we do so on a regular basis. And also Court of Steel Board, they have provided a statement of support for this. Uh, so they support uh, the work in this respect. If you're interested in this kind of work, I've provided here an overview of some uh, uh, Zenodo links uh, to uh, component documents that we have uh, provided. So we worked on Court of Steel plus FAIR, also a report on FAIR ecosystem. And the last bullet is there meant to tell you that we have an upcoming work package deliverable which integrates those component uh, documents. It will be released at the beginning of June and we will be seeking uh, wider community feedback. The second thing uh, we do uh, under the umbrella of FAIR enabling is that we offer support uh, with the core trust seal angle. Uh, to 10 FAIRS FAIR supported repositories. So what we do, we go with those repositories on a journey towards trust and FAIR. And on the other hand, those repositories provide us the input and share their experience on how their repository practices enable FAIR. So it works both ways. Uh, we have uh, selected them through a call of repository involvement. Um, we will extend uh, this a limited group of FAIRS FAIR support repositories, which are 10, to a wider European network of trustworthy repositories enabling FAIR data. Uh, and also, obviously, we need to take the wider network, more like the, glo the global network also, into account of uh, FAIR and core trust steel stakeholders. Uh, this slide is uh, meant to provide a little bit more detail on how we support the repositories. So you see here the core trust seal process, uh, which consists of self-assessment and peer review. And you can see uh, uh, um, yeah, a circle with the Ferris Fair logo and uh, a yellow band, which indicates that our Ferris Fair support engages uh, at the self-assessment point of the process. So we provide support before the repositories uh, submit their uh, self-assessment formally to the Core Trust Seal Board. The third thing we do under the umbrella of FAIR enabling repositories is we are working on uh, improved descriptions for repository metadata. Um, the ideal outcome of that would be that we would have a better description of organizational and data collection metadata. And ultimately, obviously, we hope that then the, reposit the relevant repositories are better uh, findable for all stakeholders. Uh, and this work is supported by uh, the work on the Court of Steel plus FAIR alignment, as well as our work on the object assessment uh, against FAIR. And exactly this point is where I'm heading to with the last part of my presentation. So uh, here I have a, a couple of slides uh, that indicate what we are doing in the area of evaluation of uh, object fairness. Uh, fair is Fair is uh, developing and running pilots um, with two primary use cases uh, that help assess uh, the fairness of individual data sets within repositories. So we have two primary use cases. One is focused towards researchers, and we will uh, develop there a, a manual self-assessment tool. It's like a, a, a fair awareness and education tool. It's meant to be used prior to deposit. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we would like to tailor uh, an automated assessment for uh, data repositories, and that's meant to be after uh, the data publication. If you want to know more about the use cases, stakeholders, and our design approach uh, for the evaluation of object fairness, I've included here uh, one of our deliverables. Uh, it's also open for community feedback, um, and I put it at the lower end of the slide here. 
the next slide gives you uh, two uh, tool set snippets. So on the lower left hand side, uh, you see a tool snippet uh, of the manual self-assessment awareness tool where the researchers can fill in questions and where they can be uh, that where they can raise awareness and can be educated on how to improve the FAIR data before uh, depositing. And on the right hand side, there is an, uh, a work in progress on uh, an automated assessment tool and you'll see a snippet there uh, on the right. Again, uh, this is a slide with some more pointers and links if you're interested in this work. The deliverable on top I already mentioned. We also have a uh, metric specification we are using for our uh, pilots. It's available on Zenodo as well. And uh, yeah, last but not least, we are also working closely in collaboration with the RDA Fair Data Maturity Working Group. Uh, we've done testing and uh, yeah, contributed to a lot of uh, aspects of the work. But recently, we've also compiled a uh, a detailed uh, project response feedback uh, to their uh, specification and guidelines. So it's also open for everybody to, uh, to see there. To conclude, um, I think it's quite, uh, I've said it a couple of times already, but really for me the conclusion is that FAIR for objects and FAIR enabling, they evolve in parallel. Um, Another important takeaway would be that we are mapping object characteristics to where repositories can enable FAIR. Um, we do in the conviction that uh, FAIR and Cortial Seal approaches are complementary and well aligned. Uh, FAIR is FAIR offers support with a Cortial Seal plus FAIR angle. Uh, and later, um, that will be really interesting for the uh, remaining part of the project, will be to see how we can integrate the object evaluation outcomes into, a re into repository uh, assessments. So there we can see how we can align the repository practices with the FAIR scores of their collections. And so we will have uh, interesting uh, times ahead of us. Uh, we work here with the, this great team of people. We have, I think, 12 people working uh, on this. Uh, Dans is the uh, work package lead. Uh, I'm work package leader of this work package for. We work together with uh, DCC, with uh, Data Site Read Through Data, uh, University Bremen, uh, which is Pangea, uh, CNES, and also the UK Data Archive. So this is the end then of my presentation. And now I would also like to go to Menti. Um, it's the same code, so I will stop uh, sharing my screen. I would like to invite Sarah to open uh, uh, the Menti uh, again, please. Yes, it's there, Ilona. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so the first question. Uh, is everybody okay to see the Menti slides? Yes, I hear. Yes, thank you for your confirmation. So, uh, how important is it for you that characteristics of fair digital objects are aligned with repository contexts? And I would love to hear some motivation as well, if you dare. I'm still here. I'm just waiting for some responses to come in. Thank you very much for the first contributors. So I see some indications that people uh, do find it uh, important. They, well, they share the same uh, opinion as, as I have. Awesome. 
also interesting that another one says, well, I'd say it's not that important, not too important, because repositories should adjust the deposits more than vice versa. Yes, clear enough. Thanks for the contribution. Yeah, and I've, I've seen what I take up from the answers here as well, that uh, community acceptance uh, of, uh, uh, of the FAIR principles is very important before it can be, uh, can be uh, elaborated into repository requirements. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm just waiting for a couple of seconds before I will go to the next question. It was a difficult question to start with, but thank you for formulating and expressing your views. And I was also interested in one person saying, uh, uh, not important. Um, thank, thank you for sharing your views, um, either by raising your hands in the Zoom or by uh, yeah, making yourself known in the chat. Is there somebody who would like to share his or her view with us? I don't see any raised hands um, or I don't see anything in the chat. Well, thank you very much for your writing. Very helpful to us. Um, I would like to propose to go to the next question, please. Um, maybe this gets you going. <laughs> what are the main challenges around FAIR enabling repositories? Would you be so kind to give your opinion on this. So I see coming in one vote. Thank you. Three. Not all data is fair yet. <laughs> That's interesting one as well. Everything is evolving around the indicators. A lack of clarity. Yeah, that relates also to the things that are still evolving. In the chat, I see also a uh, participant coming in on sustainability. That uh, would be a main challenge. And it comes also apparent that uh, the costs and the staff resources are uh, a point of, or an issue you are thinking about when it's when you think about a challenge and another comment uh, in the chat from a participant that states that it may seem a difficult process um, maybe too difficult is there anybody who would like to uh share with me uh yeah the reason behind the main challenge around fair enabling repository certification you can either please raise your hands or make yourself known in the chat uh yes i'll kyle i'll unmute you unmute you in a bit uh you're unmuted kyle yes please Hi, uh, thanks. Um, 
I wanted to just raise the, the issue that one of the challenges for us, um, I, I work for GBIF, Global Biodiversity Information Facility, um, mm. and, and we, um, it's sort of like Schrodinger's repository. Uh, we both are and are not um, a repository. We're a federated network. Um, there are ways in which uh, data um, have and, and always have persisted. Um, but the challenge of actually trying to approach certification from a, a federated or network model um, is quite challenging. Um, yeah. And uh, we're, we're, you know, we feel that uh, we align very well across the board on fair data metrics, but uh, trying yeah. to walk through a stepwise uh, certification process presents real challenges for us. Yeah, okay, thanks for sharing that. And what do you think can or should be done to, yeah, to improve that? Who should take an action on, on that, you think? Okay, I think Kyle lowered his hand, so he cannot uh, talk anymore. Don't worry, Kyle. <laughs> Do you want to say something, Kyle, or should I proceed? That's okay as well. Uh, while we are waiting then, um, I have received uh, in the chat also by, um, I think it's by, Hella Hollander, is it possible to do uh, step by step then? Uh, is there something you would like to say about that, uh, Hella, to the audience? I'll try to find you and unmute you. One moment, please. Hi, I'm Hella Hollander. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Hella Hollander. I'm a colleague of, of uh, Ilona. I'm working at DANS, head of the archiving team, but also project leader in Ariadne Plus. And so, yeah, I worked in parts of those different uh, communities from the cultural heritage perspective. And I think um, uh, uh, to find the, the start or the beginning of this process is the most difficult part. If I see people who are at, at, um, at the bottom of this process, where do I start? Who do I contact? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I do this step by step? What is um, how can I learn? Uh, how do I get the expertise? Is it really that difficult? The questions like this, so how, uh, <laughs> like a roadmap, perhaps. And, yeah. and um, I comment what's a challenge also uh, to have enough reviewers because, well, when you have 40 people willing to make one step ahead, how do you uh, train those people? Who, how, how do you help them? Yeah. The so this, this was my, this, these were my answers and questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I really understand that. So really the basic question. So where should I start? And um, so like I explained, I can give you a little pointer you might be able to use in your community. Uh, for example, we've created some uh, workshop material with a road mapping exercise and a stakeholder mind map exercise. Uh, we, in first instance, we tailored it towards the 10 support repositories. However, we also generalized it so it can be used uh, also by others uh, seeking uh, trust certification and FAIR. So, yeah, we're trying to deploy activities in that area as well. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Joella. Yes. <laughs> uh, with an eye on the time, I would like to go to the next question. I have two left. Um, so the next question, Sarah, please. Give it a little bit of the bright side. What are the main opportunities uh, offered through FAIR enabling repository certification? Open science in general. Yeah, that's an important one as well. Easing the burden on research. So actually, that would be all about it, right? That we make the life uh, easier for the researchers. 
so that it can take the burden of individual researchers in making data fair. Yeah, I agree with that. I also like to see that the um, the the key uh, phrase of improvement is there. So yeah, through good practices, we work all together to improve improve our repository practices, ultimately serving uh, the researcher. I like that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I did see a raised hand by, uh, I think it was uh, Paolo Mangi uh, a couple of minutes ago. So I would like to open the microphone for Paolo Mangi to respond. Hello, that was uh, for the previous question, but I can elaborate right, okay. on both. Okay, we go back to the challenges then, sure. <laughs> and, and, well, it's uh, actually both sides, I think. Okay. Um, this actually links to the, the similar comment that I made in, my previous, uh, in the previous uh, session. So I think uh, repositories cannot be left alone in this uh, uh, fairness certification process. So mm. there are aspects of fairness that cannot be uh, just measured based on the metadata, but must be ensured by the process that generates the data. So the payload itself, for example, uh, the quality of content in terms of uh, ability to reuse it uh, cannot just be described by metadata, but must be ensured by the process that generates the data. Yeah. If it's a thematic service that uh, on behalf of the users performs the deposition, ensures that certain conditions are respected, is certified accordingly and uh, its certification can be even stored as part of its uh, accounting system within the, the the repository then this process is simplified again thematic services should be more involved this yeah this decoupling of where we do science and where we store science should end with the uh, open science the, the two systems should be connected yeah, okay, thank you for your comment. I, I also think that uh, quality data curation really should involve uh, community experts and uh, community uh, current community practices should be respected. So uh, I support that as well. Uh, thank you, Paolo. Um, is there anybody in the audience who would like to share his or her opinion on one of the things they answered uh, as an opportunity offered through FAIR enabling repository certification? I don't see anything coming in. So then I would like to suggest to go to the next question and it's the last one. So the question here would like I would like to you to think about is how much do you consider trustworthy data repository status and fair data to be a journey? So one strongly disagree, ten strongly agree. I see already 20 uh, responses coming in. Thank you so much. So, well, it's very clear. <laughs> you do really see this as a journey and uh, I'm taking this perspective as well because I think that if we have an uh, approach um, for repositories that might give them some indicators of where they are, where they want to go, what, that, what they can do to improve, um, yeah, they can reach a higher level of maturity. So I am in favor of, of this as well. And uh, somebody in the chat mentioned that it's very important to go step by step and that's, yeah, hints towards your journey as well. Thank you for that. 
um, the last opportunity for the audience to uh, reflect on one of these uh, Mentimeter discussions. So if there's something you would like to say, please raise your hand or use the chat. It will be open, uh, the chat and the raising hands, obviously. So that would be the end of the FAIR enabling uh, data repository servers uh, perspective. We have, with an eye on the time, 15 minutes left for a, a general uh, Q&A round. So we can go on the FAIR enabling services from Hilco. We can dive a little bit deeper into the repositories, what you like. And I would like to ask uh, uh, Sarah to take back control of the share screen, please. Yeah, I have it already, yeah. Yeah, and if you would like be so kind to put up the last uh, slides and moderate the Q&A session, that uh, would be great. Okay. So if I go back to the uh, chat and the comments I've seen there, there were a few of you who raised the point of um, the effort needed to enter such a process and in particular for small repositories. I've seen comments by Andras Hall, uh, Joy Davidson and uh, Kate Russell, maybe. So I don't know if any of you want to further elaborate on, on this. Andras, yes. Uh, give me a second. Uh, yes, uh, you're... No, oh. sorry. Uh, yeah, go on. You're uh, I've uh, added uh, another comment at the chat window. And I think uh, uh, while uh, uh, certificating repositories is important, uh, it's even more important uh, to uh, create a fair enabling uh, uh, workflow, a fair enabling uh, process, uh, of which uh, only uh, a part is the repository, is uh, uh, the archiving place. Uh, and I think uh, uh, in, in this process, more component, uh, all components are important. So the bur burden shouldn't be put on the researcher. It should uh, uh, Rather, the researcher should use uh, 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 proper tools, fa fair enabling tools, uh, proper practices, uh, and uh, all the uh, environment, uh, the services should be also fair enabling. Uh, and in this way, uh, 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 we could really bring uh, lots of research data uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to be fair. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, 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 certificating repositories or uh, making repositories more fair friendly is important. But uh, what I see is that uh, some of this burden could be shifted from the repository operators to, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, creators of repository software. What I'm saying is obviously not true for uh, uh, big data centers uh, which operate uh, with their own software, but uh, for small repositories, uh, I think uh, it's uh, uh, more important uh, to uh, have uh, the software they use uh, 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 fair uh, friendly or fair supporting and uh, 
of course, software is not uh, uh, everything. They need to change their practices. They need to adjust their practices. But uh, 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 my opinion is that uh, there are much more important steps, not uh, uh, just only the certification of the repositories or the efforts of the repository managers. Yes. Thank okay, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, so. Uh, I fully agree that we work here with a full fair ecosystem and we've also tried to incorporate the broader view uh, for Hilke and me uh, together to share our work uh, in, on evaluation in a, a fair ecosystem. And what I would like to contribute as well, and then I'm also referring to the Turning Fair into Reality report, that I think it would be good if we would have uh, registries for finding such components uh, of an ecosystem so it will be more easy to to find the relevant ones uh, for the users ultimately absolutely thank you Andreas. Uh, i believe mustafa also wants to uh, reply can you try and unmute yourself yeah Hi, thanks, Sarah, um, and thanks to Hilke and Ilona for the, the great presentations. I just wanted to react um, on the question of the cost and the effort needed for the certification. And I, I think I would like to ask the, the reverse question, not the cost of the certification is, itself, but the cost of not being certified. The thing is that certification, people think, is gaining something like a label or a badge or um, some kind of uh, recognition and reputation. I think that is part of the certification, but it, it's actually the trivial part of the certification. The most important part is the process that's behind it, um, more than the, the reputation you gain from it. Um, and if we think of it like this, I think it becomes more obvious what is the cost of not doing it. Um, if you're if you're not going through this process, you run the risk um, um, of um, not applying good practice. As we all, I think, agreed that it's an, an important aspect. Um, you, you run the risk of not being um, following the, the community standards. You, you run many risks in in not doing your job correctly. Basically, um, so I think. The key point for me is not to focus on the end result of the certification, but more on, on the process and what it brings to you as um, a business, as um, a service provider. Um, I, I think that the advantages are, are quite, um, quite obvious if you, if you look at it from, from that perspective rather than the just gaining something at the end. So it was just a comment, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. So I presume you were also really in favor of the journey uh, approach toward it. So thank you for sharing this view, Mustafa. Thank you. And since we are reaching the end, I would like maybe to just close with one comment um, I saw from Francoise Genova. And uh, she was, she, I'm not sure she, she's still there, but she was mentioning, she was asking, a, I think, a provocative question. So is this just a problem of costs or, or sources or include staff expertise? Uh, I don't know, Francoise, if you want to expand on this, since this might also uh, affect uh, another um, area of activities where Fersfer is involved, which is the um, skills and professionalizations of data stewards. Uh, so, Francoise, are you there? Um, I don't see her in the list anymore, Sarah. Uh, no, uh, I think she can you speak, Francoise? Now, I guess, yes, yes, now, now I can. Thanks. Yes, I am still here, but uh. You didn't show me, so I I I was trying to to understand because I understand the problem of costs, of course, and it was a big thing in the middle of the screen. So uh, you one has to think about what it means. It's clear that there is the, the question of smaller repositories uh, that Andreas was uh, discussing, 
But I think that uh, the cost, uh, when you say the cost of staff and so on, there, there is also the question of expertise. And this is not only for fair, it's for the whole question of repositories and trustworthiness. But in the case of fair, there is an additional expertise in some cases to what repositories are used to do, especially those who are just taking, if you think about the core trust shield scale, those who are the, not the scale of uh, 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 compliance, but uh, the, the repositories which are just taking the data as it is and then <coughs> preserving it and distributing it. Uh, to get fairness, you may have a much stronger role of the repositories, especially if they help people to bring more elements of fairness. So expertise is really, it's included in the cost and yeah. in the skills, as you say, but I think that uh, there is more expertise for the staff required if you want to have fair enabling repositories yeah. in general. Thank you, Françoise. We would all go back to data curation activities as well, right? So in order to, for the data to be available and accessible in the long term as well, we need uh, curate, curation activities for that. So thank you for this contribution. Andres, uh, I see your hand raised. So You should be able to unmute yourself now and then we. Sorry, uh, I just uh, left my hand raised. Uh, okay, <laughs> it's fine. Okay, great. So I, I don't see any other and, and raised. So I think we can, can thank all our participants and the chairs for this uh, very active session. So thank you again for uh, joining us. Sorry? And thank you to everybody in the audience for joining us yeah. and sharing your views. Super valuable. Thank you very much. <laughs> so all the materials will be uploaded in the ELSC Hub Week event page and we'll also um, have them uh, shared via Fairs Fairs uh, channels. So stay, stay tuned and have a nice rest of the ELSC Hub Week. Thank you all.